Oops. Good morning. Um, welcome to our very first episode of Logging On. I'm Melissa Yapel, and I have with me today um, our friends from the Division of Forestry. So um, I want to quickly introduce who we have on screen here, and then we will get started with the program, which is talking about the history of Ohio's forests. So I have with me um, Kelsey Denny. Kelsey is a program administrator with the Division of Forestry, and she's going to be helping me with questions today. So if anybody has any questions throughout the program, please folks utilize the Q&A box. I'll say hello there in just a minute so you know where exactly that is. Um, and then I also have our presenters with us, Don Karras, who he does information and education with the Division of Forestry. He's going to be our first presenter, and then we're going to pass it off to Cotton Randall, who is a private lands administrator with forestry. So I'm super excited um, for today's program and don't want to waste too much time talking at you at the beginning here before we get started, but I do want to let you know what we have coming up um, throughout the month with this new series. So as I said, today we're talking about the history of Ohio's forests. Next week, we will be doing tree ID. So if you want to learn how to ID trees, please join us next week at 10 a.m. on the 15th. All of these will be on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Um, the following week on the 22nd, we will be talking about urban forestry. And then last but not least, um, on the 29th, we will be talking about wildfire prevention. And as you can see here, maybe I have a, one of my smoky bear hats on. So I'm super excited for really this whole month, but who doesn't love smoky, right? So I'm gonna pass it off to Don now and we will get started. So. Thank you. Yep. Go ahead, Don. I'm hoping I did it. Um, it is loading, so Don's PowerPoint will be popping up in just a second for you guys. There we go. Okay. In the early 1800s, well, anyway, this is the history of Ohio's forests and stewardship. And again, she said it was Cotton and I doing the presentation. And prior to 1900, in the early 1800s, settlers traveled into the Northwest Territory and found a wilderness. Actually, it was the end of the 18th century in the late 1700s. And by finding a wilderness, they mean that Ohio's lands were over 95% forest cover. Then from 1815 to 1840, there's a massive land clearing, started with the starting with the largest and best trees. Now the areas where the largest and best trees grew, of course, were an indication of fertility. And then the flatlands were cleared first because they were the easiest to farm. And then as the trees were eliminated, the squirrels became a problem. One of the first acts of our state legislature was required each man to annually produce to the township trustees a minimum of 100 squirrel scalps, and there was a bonus for more and penalties for less. Reason being, you know, there, there were no trees, so the squirrels didn't have um, the mass to eat, and the, they were eating the farmer's crops, and they didn't have the trees to live in and all that, so they became a quite a destructive pest. And then, you know, there was a tremendous loss of forested land in Ohio. And uh, after the, you know, the early 1800s, uh, the loss was even more rapid. So one of the things that uh, the reason for the loss of forest cover, obviously, was for farmers. People were moving here. The settlers were moving here. They had, they were primarily what they call subsistence farming meaning that they grew their own crops and everything that they lived on, all their own livestock. And the, of course, the trees were in the way to do this. So they would kill the trees and farm around the, the standing dead trees. They'd kill the trees by girdling them, you know, by severing the bark all the way and cambium all the way around the tree, thereby deadening the tree. Then they would farm around them 
And then they would, uh, um, in the off season when the crops weren't growing, they would drop these trees, roll them down into a big pile and, and burn them up. So it was a lot of slash and burn type farming and they didn't know a lot about fertilization. So when they would use up an area, they would move on to another area as far as, you know, clearing and begin to farm that. They didn't know, again, a lot about erosion control and uh, what types of ground they should be farming. And a lot of the farms were uh, rather unsuccessful. And again, they would deplete the soils and, and move on. So in 1885, the Ohio General Assembly created the Ohio Forestry Bureau. And then the Bureau studied the problems with forestry and or the, at least the, not forestry as a science, but the, the, the state of the forest was deplorable and they were chosen to study them. And uh, there was just like three guys that worked for this Ohio Forestry Bureau. They spent about two or three years. They wrote some real nice reports. They made reports to Congress. Nobody listened to them. So at the end of their three year period of assignment, they pretty much just quit. But the, the Bureau itself was never officially disbanded until like 1906, they formed the Division of Forestry and it was originally part of the Ohio Agricultural Experiment Station in Wooster, Ohio. And there they were tasked to study the condition of Ohio's forest resource, which again was in fairly bad shape. The uh, besides just farming and, you know, for agricultural crops, they were also the settlers were also removing all the trees from the hillsides and making pasture, whether it was good place to make pasture or not. And a lot of that, um, a lot of the places that they still had woods, they were running livestock in. They really had no uh, concern about the condition of the forest. They were really pretty much in their way for their farming. So they did a lot of, they didn't attempt to put out fires. They did uh, attempt to keep the livestock out of their woods. And with the fire and the livestock and the, you know, the growing population needing more ground to farm, the forests were reduced drastically uh, from that 95% forest to more like about four or five percent forest cover. Um, but there was no real exact study done on number of acres of forest left. But by old reports and old journals and stuff that I've read, they were in pretty bad shape, the little bit of forest that was left. Then in 1915, the Ohio General Assembly, oh, I should mention first that Congress passed the Weeks Law for both federal and state for cooperation and the creation of national forests in the Eastern United States. That was in 1911. Then in 1915, the Ohio General Assembly appropriated $10,000 for the start of the state forest system. And the most they were allowed to spend was $10 an acre. So the ground they got was pretty much the worst. And then the state forest system actually started in 1916 with the purchase of 211 acres um, at $9 an acre in Athens County and this was uh, Waterloo State Forest. Later that same year, they also bought uh, a couple of thousand acres um, for um, Dean State Forest. So those were the two first state forests. But what they were actually purchased for was ground to grow trees on, um, seedlings, and, and to experiment with weather generation. In other words, letting tree seed in themselves and keeping the cows out and uh, not mowing and to see which types of sites grew best back to trees left alone, which types of sites that they actually needed to grow trees on, and which kinds of trees were best suited for this depleted soil condition. 
and in 1921, of course, there was a, an exception to the $10 an acre limit uh, enacted to allow the purchase of something that were called forest parks, and those were to protect areas of unique geologic and scenic beauty, like the Mohican Gorge and the areas at uh, Hawking State Forest that are now parts of Hawking State Park, like Cedar Falls and Rock House. And hey, Don. Like yes. Does Waterloo State Forest still exist today? Oh, good question. Waterloo State Forest is kind of like it still exists, but it's surrounded by we know where the boundaries are, but you'd never be able to find them. They're surrounded by Zaleski State Forest. Ah, Zaleski gotcha. State Forest was. Are you interested in how that was formed? If you want to tell the story, I'm listening. OK, well, <laughs> Zaleski State Forest was part of the Resettlement Act that was passed in 1937 that the Bureau of Land Management um, bought a lot of um, property and then they resettled people. It was actually called the Resettlement Administration then, but they resettled people. They moved them off of these poorly depleted farms. A lot of people were going bankrupt. It was, uh, you know, not just Wall Street that crashed, but the entire country and the farmers were trying to eke out a living on some very poor ground. And there were three areas that the uh, um, Forest Service identified, or this, what do you call that, uh, Resettlement Administration identified, moved people out of those areas, and then they started with Zaleski State Forest. It wasn't called that then. It was the Zaleski Resettlement Area. 1937, 1939, they passed on um, administrative responsibility to the Division of Forestry, which again was part of OAES back then. And um, then, you know, as as we all know, Zaleski's grown to be quite a large state forest. And in 1957, they passed ownership of the property, the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, passed ownership of the property to the state of Ohio Department of Natural Resources. So anyway, that's where Waterloo is. But I have some other pictures of Waterloo later in these slides. Okay, you're a wealth of knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is this is where I get most of my knowledge. We have in the Division of Forestry headquarters, main office, we have a wealth of information. This particular report is from that Zaleski um, resettlement um, and. Um, there was a, the gentleman that was manager of uh, Waterloo wrote this report suggesting that the area become uh, one of the resettlement areas after that resettlement act that was passed. And he's got some pictures. It, it's just an unbelievable uh, relic of the past and a historical document. We've got a lot of photos and such from the 30s and 40s in our files and I tend to read a lot of this stuff over and over again. But this is what a lot of the area looked like after they, um, in this particular operation, I don't know if you can see there's, it's it's a not particularly well focused picture, but it's <laughs> because it's such an old picture. This is like from the 20s where they were um, in 30s, where they were harvesting all the trees um, off of an area to make charcoal for the iron furnaces. And there, right there is where they have them all piled up and then they cover them up with soil and they light them to burn Somebody stands watch all night. They burn for a couple of days until they all this wood turns into charcoal. And then they use the charcoal in the iron furnaces. Um, it, it, part of the state of Ohio and into West Virginia is called the hanging iron rock, uh, the hanging rock iron region of the United States. There were 69 um, iron furnaces that they used to make pig iron and that was like from you know 
1825 to 1875, 1880 in that area. And then, of course, when they discovered the um, the iron, rich iron deposits in uh, now by Lake Superior and all that, the, and they invented the Bessemer furnace for making steel, iron became less important. But of course, each one of these um, 69 iron furnaces would eat up a lot of timber around it or use up a lot of timber to make this charcoal to fire the furnaces to melt the uh, the sandstone that had the iron deposits in it iron ore and then the ore would flow out the bottom of the furnace and um, they used a lot of that iron for um, even in civil war for making munitions for the civil war effort and, but all of those products in 19 or 1825, they built the um, the canal that brought a lot of uh, supplies and people and actually was when people first started using money. Before that, in Ohio, everything was barter. They would trade, somebody would trade corn for, you know, milk from somebody else's cow or whatever. It was all done by the barter system. And then in 1825 to 1832, when they built the um, Ohio Erie Canal and all that, not only supplies came into the area, but actually they paid people in cash. So now they had money, but they were still farming. And this this is a, a typical picture of what happened when uh, when they started farming. And on the ground that shouldn't have been farmed when they started removed all the trees and pastured and and I have several photos that show um, this erosion. This was actually an area that was purchased with that ten dollars an acre limit on it for the formation of the state forest. Most of the state forest started out looking like this or like this. This was again, you'll see some real erosion and some gully erosion and they were trying to farm the side of this hill and not being very successful at retaining the soil. And once the soil all erodes away, then you've got a very poor farm, of course. When it gets really severe, it starts to look like this. This is another area that was bought for state forest land back in the 20s and 30s. And then you can see the, the bare patches are all the erosion. And then the, the those are real, that's real and sheet. You can see the rills are the, the finer lines of erosion. And then the sheet is the big bare patches. And then of course the gully is rather obvious, but those are all from removing the trees, pasturing, trying to farm. You see the crops up in the upper right portion of the picture. That's the flatter parts they, they put crops on and the rest they tried to pasture. They actually even tried to grow crops on some of this ground. But I'm showing these slides so you can see this farm, how all this sheet erosion, all the soil that is so poor that it doesn't even hold the grass that they're trying to grow on it. And again, when they farmed where they were, they didn't have the big fancy tractors we have now, obviously. They did all this with teams and they just followed the path that was easiest for the team to follow. And that was, a, again, a source of the water would run right down that, right down and into the and form real gully and sheet erosion there. This is, again, another area that was purchased for state forest land. So the Division of Forestry goes to work. Hey, Don. Yes. Sorry, before we move on, I have a question that came in. Um, are there any state forests still in their natural state? Do you know? Well, I would have <laughs> by my definition of natural state, they're certainly all in their natural state. If they're asking if there are any virgin forests left, those uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but those are um, really pretty much non-existent. But the older growth forests are, some of them are preserved 
and they were, of course, most of them bought by the Division of Forestry when it was the Division of Forestry Preserves. And again, I'll, I'll touch on that again a little bit later. Okay, thanks. But no, I don't think you're going to find an area of state forest that's been untouched. A lot of this was planted by, you know, this is tree planting. This is a tree planting machine and, and, and being towed by a tractor. And if you see the tractor has steel wheels, there was a lot of, and, and there's no rubber on this thing. There was a lot of thorns and um, they they'd go about 20 feet before they'd have a flat tire with the old fashioned tires. And so they mostly had steel wheels, but this is a machine planting trees. Two guys riding in it. Dressed in typical fashion back then, everybody wore a suit in the woods. <laughs> this is a um, a crew of uh, uh, African Americans from one of the uh, civilian conservation camps from the uh, 1932 era. They're planting trees. Obviously, they're lined up, spaced about eight feet apart, and planting trees along the the field there in the bottom. There's a gentleman planting some trees on the side of a hill. This is the type of land that was acquired by the Division of Forestry, and this is what eventually grew into the beautiful state forest that you see now. A lot of it was hand planted. Now, remember the real erosion and gully erosion that I showed earlier? These wooden structures were built by hand, of course. There weren't very many machines. You see the trees planted on the uh, oh, and then the, the reason these wooden structures were erected was as the soil would move down slope, it would get trapped in there and then build that gully back up to being somewhat more level with more fertile soil in it and prevented the soil from going all the way down the hill and into the creek. This is uh, one of our early chief state foresters, O.A. Alderman, standing on uh, one of the structures. And you can see how they're starting to fill up with sediment in here. And then eventually, this would all be somewhat level. These structures would be completely under soil. The wood would rot up and then you'd, um, with the trees planted and the grass cover and other herbaceous vegetation, this soil would stop moving like it, at the rate, alarming rate that it was moving. Here they're planting trees on the side of a hill and you notice there's, there's still trees standing here and you wonder what in the world are they planting trees for? Well, if you look at the ground, there's no leaf litter. I s believe what's happened is, and, and I see on the uphill side of this one tree at least, where fire has probably deadened these trees. These are stems standing. The fire has burnt up the leaf litter. It's killed these trees and they're replanting to trees along this hillside to reforest the state forest area. This again is state forest where um, the whole hillside was eroded. You see the real erosion, sheet erosion, no vegetation. What they did was they laid um, like trees, small diameter trees across the slope. And they uh, they did some hand work with uh, mattocks and such to, to form a soil like barrier so and wood barrier so that the water wouldn't run down the slope so fast. And then you can see there are, if you look closely enough, you can see there are little trees planted all along this hillside to reforest it. They're continuing this work off to the left is, is when you look at the picture. There's a typical tree plant and crew. This guy's got different types of tools, long handled shovels, and this, this gentleman in the front is uh, holding a, a mattock. It was uh, one of the primary tools that trees were planted with, especially on the side of a hill. 
But these guys aren't wearing suits like those guys with the tree planting machine. I think they're working a little harder. But they're still pretty well dressed. All of those things the Division of Forestry did, and then great things happened. It's the Daughter of American Revolution plantation. Um, there are trees planted in the background. They're kind of hard to see, but they're not hard to see anymore. I mean, this uh, area was dedicated in 1958, but this is up at um, Mohican. There's the shrine. It uh, is up there for the war veterans that were planted by the Federation. I mean, the, the money was donated by the Federation of Women's Clubs. But I show you that picture because I want to show you that picture. That's what it looks like now with the trees planted. And uh, there's the shrine and it mentions the Ohio Federation of Women's Clubs in cooperation with the Division of Forestry. And that's it. Mohican Memorial State Forest. Here's a picture on the left. Shows uh, what it looked like when the Mohican State Forest was acquired, first acquired. And then same spot. Picture taken on the right. With the trees all having filled in and grown back. There's a planted field. I believe this one is at Hawking State Forest in the 30s, 40, 30s and 40s, this was a, there were 26 of those uh, 3C camps that I mentioned. Um, a couple of them were African American, and most of them were, of course, just, um, uh, you had to be a male between a certain age, and you're, you know, like 21 to, I think it was 30 years old, somewhere in there, but, uh, your family had to be like not have a job. So they made like $5 a day or something and most of it they sent home to their families. But anyway, they planted these trees. And then about eight years later, that's what that same spot looked like. And here I've mentioned before the water loop where I said it's been pretty much surrounded by Zaleski State Forest. This is a field that they originally acquired. It was an abandoned field. And this is one of the early experiments with planting trees. They both planted trees to see how they would grow. And then they planted trees so that they could um, reforest private lands as well. But they were developing techniques. But these are white pine planted at Waterloo on the side of a hill. Eight years later, there's that same hill. That's about the mid 40s. I can, you know, by the attire, there's no real date on there for me to be certain. And I can't quite see the tops of the trees to count, you know, to, to be able to say like a white pine, you, you know, this is a, a year old down here, two, three, four, five, six. That's how you count, count the worlds. You can count how old the tree was from the time it was this tall, at least. But in any event, the trees were at water and it grew pretty well. And this picture is from the 70s. And you can see how much bigger that same hillside of trees became. Then I mentioned earlier that in 1933, the Works Project Progress Administration, that was when the first survey was started of Ohio's forest resource. And, and they found that Ohio was down to about 14% forest cover at that time. But there had already been some reforestation efforts take place then. And I mentioned the 26 civilian conservation core camps. They were all under the direction of the Division of Forestry's state forester. And they planted millions of seedlings. Um, and they, they built fire towers. Actually, there were in 18 months, they built 11 steel fire towers on uh, state forests and park areas. And then the they built roads and the recreational facilities and a lot of the, the old cabins that you see and the, the roads and the, the entire infrastructure of most of our state early state forests were actually built by the Civilian Conservation Corps in conjunction with carpenters working for the Division of Forestry, all of them under the direction of the Chief State Forester of 
And then the, I mentioned that Resettlement Act um, when we were talking about Zaleski, but Tar Hollow and Blue Rock were also part of that 1937 program. Then in 1949, the Division of Forestry became one of seven tar charter divisions within the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. The recreational facilities moved to a newly created Division of Parks, which is now, of course, called Division of Parks and Watercraft. But in 1965, the division combined with the Division of Reclamation, and at that time it was called the Division of Forestry and Reclamation, and we, we were together from 65 to 71. There, there were 15 million seedlings planted, produced and planted, produced on uh, nurseries owned by the, and operated by the Division of Forestry. They were produced and planted to reclaim pre-law surface mines. At pre-law, 1971 or right in that area, they, um, Ohio legislature passed the law that a certain level of reclamation had to be done on the land before the um, operator of the surface mine what bond money was released. But again, in then in 19... So anyway, getting, getting back to this, there were three areas that were reclamation areas that became state forests. Some of them um, are... Um, growing trees pretty well, but some of it, it, it still needs some work. It's Perry State Forest, Harrison State Forest, and Fernwood State Forest are all part of this acquisition that the division got when we were part and, and whole with the Division of Reclamation. 1973, the division became, um, the. I'm sorry, 1973, the Division of Forestry became the Division of Forests and Preserves. And then from 71 to 75, the division bought 19 preserves, added two and, uh, to, to the state forest system to protect the unique and geological formations. And again, in 75, then the Division of Forestry and Preserves went back to just being the Division of Forests and the Division of Natural Areas and Preserves was formed to manage these preserves. And they, of course, they have bought quite a few um, areas and, and to preserve. And again, that's where you'll find that those older growth stands of timber would be on the uh, preserves. But, and then I mentioned that our techniques have changed over the years of uh, the hand planting and the machine being pulled by a steel wheel tractor and um, the different techniques put out. Here's the couple of guys logging with oxen. You see the yoke on the oxen and they're a team of four and they're pulling logs up out of the woods. Now they have things as fancy as this. This is called a feller buncher. It actually snips the trees off, grabs a hold of them, twists it sideways, and then these little feed rollers, it feeds the log right through there and trims the branches off. And then it's moved with this piece of equipment that's called a forwarder. See the, we're talking about oxen and cutting trees down with the uh, uh, crosscut saw and such like that. And, now they're using big pieces of machinery that can snip the trees right off or chainsaws, of course. And then this is the a forwarder. It goes along in the woods where the feller buncher has laid trees down, picks them up, puts them on the back, brings them to the log loading area, and they go on the log truck. This is a shelter wood harvest that was done with that feller buncher. Um, or the pictures that I showed earlier were when they were working in pine, but they also run these feller bunchers in the um, in the forest. This is doing this is a shelter wood harvest, and you can see there's not really very much in the way of skid roads and such. It prepares the site for uh, regeneration of oak. 
Here's some guys building a fire line with fire rakes. And so kind of the old technique and the new technique. Of course, it's obvious what they're doing here. They're burning in a, a fire line. And this is a old fire plow. Uh, one of the first ones that the division had. I'm pretty sure this was called a Ranger 15. And some of the people in the picture I, I worked with over the years. Most of them are quite old now, if they're still with us. Then a helicopter. We use them both to, for water uh, drops and they use them now to um, for prescribed fire. So our techniques changed. So of our forests, there's a picture of one of our newer state forests, Beaver Creek. There's where I started with the division. And it's a Blue Rock State Forest and a scene overlooking the agricultural land around it. There's Fernwood State Forest. I mentioned that that was part of the um, acquisition with reclamation. Unreclaimed surface mine planted back to trees. Shawnee State Forest, one of our first early state forests. The original acquisition there was 5,000 acres uh, of hill country where somebody thought that they were going to be able to produce livestock. Didn't do too well. Soil wouldn't hold. The grass, the grass wouldn't hold the cows. Business went under, and this is what we've got. There's a picture of Sauda Trail State Forest. It's one of our forests along State Route 23, just south of Columbus. Brush Creek State Forest. You can see the harvesting that's been done there. There's a somewhat of a regeneration harvest up on the hillside. How well it's growing back is just unbelievable. The, the pointier crown trees, if you see them, if you can pick them out, are yellow poplar. The rounder ones are oak. This is a picture of a, a demonstration area at Mohican State Forest. It's just in there to remind me to tell people that there is a Mohican State Forest uh, demonstration area where it's pretty much an educational area. This was a Clear cut done for natural regeneration in a stand that uh, was in very bad shape. The tall tree you see standing on the left is a hickory that was left for Indiana bat habitat. And the grass is one of the techniques that uh, we use for um, retaining soil on skid roads. And that's pretty much it for my presentation, but there's more coming. All and right, I'll stop sharing. I will pass it to Cotton. Oh. Okay. There we go. Okay. I good to go. You are good. All right, so I'm gonna pick up where Don left off. Don gave a really good overview and some good historical pictures to kind of show us what the past was like. And I'm gonna kind of talk about where we are now. Um, and let's see here. My slide's not advancing. There we go. So Don kind of showed this with pictures, but this little video shows it statewide, kind of what we saw from kind of a low point in the early 1900s, where we were, you know, 10% or less percent forest cover to 1994, where we got up to about 30% of the state forest and, and just about 8 million acres. And it's kind of stayed the same since then. So here's a current map of Ohio forests from the latest forest inventory data or in uh, land cover data from 2016. And you can see the green areas on this map are uh, forest land and it's 
It's about a third of the state in terms of land area, and the most heavily forested parts of the state are in the southern and eastern part of the state, or Appalachia, Ohio. And, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of where we are now and what's what's going on with Ohio's forest, but I always like to start off with just kind of talking about all the benefits and services that forests provide. Um, so there's uh, food sources in forests for wildlife and people. Um, there's forest products, um, both timber and non-timber forest products. Uh, all kinds of uh, diversity of wildlife use forests. Here's a picture I took of a family of garter snakes in, in uh, one of our forests a few years ago. Um, salamanders, birds, um, people, and particularly on our public lands. Uh, there's a lot of recreation um, that we're able to do on our forest land, whether it's hiking, biking, or, or riding a horse. Um, forests play an important role in, in clean water and, and water supplies for, for um, drinking, uh, as well as aquatic wildlife. Um, this is one of uh, our, our ponds on our state forest land where you can also do boating, boating activities, canoeing, kayaking, etc. In the urban environment, the trees are really important for, for shade, uh, beautification, they help with energy conservation, um, rainwater and watershed management. Um, so there, there's just all kinds of values of forests. Uh, I mentioned non-timber forest products. Ohio is one of the top 10 states in the country for maple, maple uh, syrup production as well. So we're always thinking about all these different benefits that our forests provide, and that's kind of what uh, the Division of Forestry and, and a lot of partners are involved with with taking care of those forests uh, in, in the current day. So I'm going to give a real quick overview of some of the Division of Forestry programs that are active today. Don gave a lot of the history of what we did in the past. Um, and this slide kind of does a real quick overview. So we've got, uh, I mentioned 8 million acres of forest land in the state, about 30% of the state, and 85% of those forests are privately owned. So you know, if you're talking about maintaining forest benefits and services, it's 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 really the private willing owner out there, uh, the Ohio citizen that's doing the bulk of the work there because it's that's where the most of our forests are. So we, we have some private lands programs to try to help private willing owners manage their woods for, for things that they want to get out of their woods and also some of these larger public benefits that all of our forests provide. So only about 15 percent of Ohio's forests are, are publicly owned, whether it's local, state or federal government. So from the state side, uh, the Division of Forestry owns, we have, uh, well, ODNR owns uh, 23 state forests, and that doesn't include the wildlife areas and the parks. This is just the state forest, um, but they cover about 200,000 acres, um, and they're managed sustainably for multiple uses, timber production, wildlife habitat, soil and water conservation, and recreation. And here's just a quick map that shows the, where those state forests are and they're the, they're green and they're labeled on this map and you can see the vast majority of them are in southern ohio and eastern ohio we've got a few uh in other parts but that's where the bulk of our forests are and that's also the most heavily forested part of the state uh, so i mentioned that they're sustainably managed our state forests are sustainably managed for for multiple uses and we actually have uh certification from two different third-party sustainable forest management um, programs, uh, SFI, Sustainable Forestry Initiative, and FSC, Forest Stewardship Council. All of our state forests are dual certified, um, and uh, we, they've been that way for, for the past decade. Uh, and then uh, we do have some, another program, PLT, Project Learning Tree, um, that we do through the division. I'll talk a little bit about that later, but it's mentioned here because PLT is now um, part under SFI, Sustainable Forestry Initiative. So they're kind of the, um, the lead organization for PLT. And then, um, you know, just some of the, I want to just mention a few other kind of large collaborative efforts that are going on in Ohio. Um, in, in Southeast Ohio, where that heavily forested uh, Part of the state is it's where the bulk of our state forest lands it's also where our only national forest is wayne national forest um, and there's a interagency team called ohio interagency forestry team um, that is working together to try to, to to maintain those forests and benefits benefits and services across all ownership state federal and private and there's there's three or four kind of core um, agencies involved so there's u.s forest service the federal 
forestry agency. Uh, NRCS, which is another federal agency under USDA that offers uh, incentives for private landowners to do management on their properties. Um, Cooperative Extension, which is Ohio State and Central State Universities, and Division of Wildlife, another ODNR division, is part of that interagency forestry team. Um, and one of the things that the, that group has been working on a lot lately is oak management. So I've got collaborative oak management. That's in Ohio. We've been doing oak management across all, all uh, ownership. And then uh, even on a larger scale, there's an effort called the White Oak Initiative that covers at least 11 states I know in, in northeastern and midwestern part of the country and also uh, multiple states in the southern part of the country. So it's just a really huge effort that's recognizing that we have some issues with oak and what can we do together to, to make, make sure we keep oak in our forest because it provides so many benefits. And then there's other kind of more specialized collaborators out there. There's one related to prescribed fire with multiple agencies and, and, and non-governmental organizations involved with it. So the way that we kind of organize in Ohio, uh, a lot of our efforts to make sure that we're focused on addressing the main issues and working together towards those, we have what's called the Ohio Force Action Plan. And we're in the process of updating that. The original one was done in 2010. And uh, this year, we're gonna come out with an updated version of the Force Action Plan. And it's got kind of two, two parts to that document and that effort. One is an assessment where we're assessing all the forest resource conditions and trends. And from that, identifying what are key issues that are affecting our forest statewide. And this is across all ownership. This is private lands, public lands. Um, and, and then from that, we've developed strategies, statewide strategies that we can do to address those issues and maintain those forest benefits. So this, I'm going to just kind of go quickly through this because I, I don't want to get down to too many details, but just give you an idea of kind of how how we're how we're functioning in this force action plan. And, and so it's kind of uh, we looked at there's six issues that were identified. Um, sustainable forest management is the first one. Public benefits from Ohio forests um, and conservation of soil and water resources. Those are kind of three of the issues. I'm not going to go through all of these, but on the right, those are some more specific strategies. Uh, or, or goals that we have to make sure that uh, we're addressing the issues and maintaining all those benefits. Uh, I had a couple there, um, but I think I'm just going to skip through these. But, um, you know, a big part of this, of, of what we do is trying to stay focused on these issues. Um, the, 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 the second half of those issues, so the, those are the first three. The, the second group is conservation of biological diversity, health and vitality of Ohio forests, and fragmentation and land use conversion. Um, so some of those those topics, uh, just to give you some examples from the biological diversity, um, oak, oak forests, oak hickory forests are really important for wildlife and diversity in our woods. And, and so that's something that we identified. We're seeing some declines or some projected declines in oak in our forests. So that's just an example of, of how we've used this process to identify things that we can focus on with our partners um, and the public. Um, and then uh, health and vitality of Ohio forests. One of the biggest things we deal with is, is invasive species. We've had emerald ash borer. Just about everybody has, has seen impacts of that with dead ash trees across the state. Um, and there's other there's there's invasive plants and other uh, pests that are, are always continuing to invade the state. And so we're always having to respond to that and, and hopefully proactively uh, keep them out of our state. And then forest fragmentation, just a natural thing as we get urbanization of our of, of into some of our rural areas, you get fragments, uh, fragmented forest. And, you know, we can't stop that fragmentation, but what we can do is help people um, manage the woods that they have so that it's more resilient uh, and can maintain those benefits even when it does get fragmented. So uh, just to summarize kind of how we're doing this with the Division of Forestry, we have different program areas um, and uh, I'm not. I'm just go through them briefly. We've got a wildfire prevention section. We deal with. We do get fires in Ohio, and we have uh, agreements with local volunteer fire departments um, and assist with fire protection. Um, the Division of Forestry has uh, fire protection areas of, of 3.7 million acres across the state. Um, and forest health. I mentioned invasive species. That's the bulk of what we're doing with our forest health programs. But we do continuous monitoring and surveying across the state to monitor pest and disease that are here already and also try to um, identify new pests as they get in before they get established so that we can respond quickly and get them under control. 
state forests we already mentioned i'm not going to talk a lot more about state forests but we've got 23 state forests covering over 200,000 acres of land uh, and a big part of that is is offering those are public lands that are available for recreation or diversity of recreation and, and um, we want to do whatever we can to make the um, uh, those resources available uh, for everybody to use um, and maintain their their healthy condition and then on private lands i mentioned that 85 percent of the state is is privately owned uh, we have 22 state service foresters that cover all counties in the state so each one of them covers anywhere from from one to i think our, our biggest has nine different counties that they county that they cover um, but if if you're a private woodland owner and you own woods you can call our state service foresters if you own just a few acres of land like less than 10 uh, they may not be able to come out and walk your property with you but they can link you up with resources that are out there online uh, workshops field days things like that and, and help you that way um, for, for folks that own more than 10 acres of woods um, you have forces that can come out and actually walk your property help you figure out what you have offer advice uh, to how to, to, to manage your woods and get the most out of it um, and then urban forestry we have six urban foresters across the state and their main role is to offer technical support to local municipalities local governments to help them manage their urban forest whether it's street trees park trees um, we're dealing with um, things like when emerald ash borer comes through and you have a huge die off of trees and there's a lot of public safety issues that come from that and our urban foresters help the, the local governments be prepared to deal with those and then that's all kind of tied together by communications and education i mentioned project learning tree earlier that's a youth education program um, that that we uh, assist local educators with uh, teaching about forests and trees um, and then we have broader communications on all the wide range of topics that we um, we deal with that's the division of forestry programs but we also have tons of partners uh, at all different levels and i'm not going to list all these but i'm not going to um, sit state all these but you can kind of look through the list we've got even within DNR there's different divisions of DNR um, division of wildlife parks and watercraft natural areas and preserves and we're all working together uh, on these um, these issues that we share uh, with the fire stuff we have this partnership with the state fire marshal and also with local fire departments across the state and we a lot of them are dealt know how to deal with uh, structural fires in an urban environment but they're not they're not well uh, trained on wildland fires and that's where we come in to help them with training and also uh, support when needed uh, a variety of federal uh, agencies both uh you know nrcs and a farm services agency um, that deal with private landowners and farmers across the state aphis is more of a pest control cooperative extension I already mentioned we work a lot with them on our outreach and education efforts department of agriculture is a huge partner with our forest health programs soil and water conservation districts at the county level, and then a whole bunch of non-governmental organizations, National Wild Turkey Federation, the Nature Conservancy, Ohio Forestry Association, Tree Farm, Farm Bureau, et cetera. And then groups that maybe you wouldn't think about in natural resource management that we still work a lot with, the county auditors, we have a property tax reduction program called Ohio Forest Tax Law. If you own over 10 acres of woods, um, we work with sportsman's club and local schools. So, um, there's a lot of work going on out there with by a lot of different partners um, and we consider ourselves the stewards of Ohio's forest and um, you know and, and so we're protecting from things like this bug right here this is Asian longhorn beetle which uh, is in Ohio and southwest Ohio Claremont County and we've been working real closely with the ODA and the USDA to to eliminate Asian longhorn beetle and any other pests that come into our state um, we work with like I said our Private lands are the bulk of our forests in the state, so we, we work a lot with private woodland owners and their their families to, to manage their woods. This is a little kid um, who we were working with their family to control. They had some vines in their woods that were overtaking their trees and ca causing damage to their trees, and he's hanging from a vine that was cut as part of that woodland improvement work. Um, we have uh, a strong wild, wildfire management program and prescribed burn management program. That's from one of our burns on, on a state forest land. And this is a, the top right. This is a picture of some work we're doing in a Hawking Hills area to try to protect our hemlock trees from the hemlock woolly adelgid. And then just uh, enjoying, enjoying the, the, the forests that are out there. Um, there's lots of, of, of great places to recreate on public land, whether it's local, state, or federal. Uh, this is uh, two kids backpacking in Zaleski State Forest. Um, so there's lots, lots of... Uh, Lots of great opportunities to get out there and enjoy the forest of Ohio. And that's 
the end of my talk. OK, well, we are um, getting close to running out of time here, but um, I do want to well thank Ra uh, Cotton Randall and Don Karras and then Kelsey, who is behind the scenes helping me. Um, thank you both. Oh, shoot, I shouldn't have done that. I'm going to go back to um, to the screen you had there, <laughs> Cotton. Um, so thank you all for helping today. Um, I do just want to uh, say for the any young viewers out there or even teachers that have have classes, um, consider maybe how the, the land in your community has changed over the years. Uh, it might be interesting to interview an older person, maybe a grandparent or an older family friend that has seen the change in the community. Um, and, and just ask them how the landscapes changed. We talked a lot about it today, you know, but it's always interesting to see um, even how your private property or your community um, around you has, has developed over the years and have the changes hurt the community? Have they helped them? Um, it might be something interesting to, to do a little bit investigating um, on your own. So, and, and maybe these Friends have pictures of property from around the area that uh, shows really how it's changed over the years. It can be fun to look at. So if you do any investigations, let us know what you find out. Um, you can go to our website and email us if you want to or contact us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, as I said at the beginning, next week we have an a episode on tree ID. And then we will be talking about urban forestry the following week and wildfire prevention to wrap the whole series up. So I hope to see you all then. Um, but once again, thanks to our presenters and to the viewers, and I hope you all have a great week. Bye.